from Microbe TV. This is Infectious Disease Puscast, episode 22, recorded on February 15th, 2023. I am Daniel Griffin, and joining me today is Sarah Dong. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Dong. Welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. How have you been doing, Daniel? <laughs> so I've been I've been doing quite well, and and I don't know if uh, how many of our listeners will watch this on YouTube, but uh, for the first time this week, uh, you were color corrected, Sarah. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be able to what... <laughs> your your true skin tones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have to see. Well, and you'll be very proud of me. I thought of you a lot because I've been doing a couple extra travel clinics recently, so that's been good. Hopefully I can apply some of our PUSCAST knowledge. Okay. Um, Yeah. Well, PUSCAST is a review of the ID literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. So on to the literature, shall we? Um, And I think I'm kicking us off today with the viral section. Remember to listen to TWIV clinical updates for timely viral related information. I wanted to start because the... Uh, HHS HIV clinical practice guidelines updated recommendations recently. I think it was right at the end of January, early February. Um, And I specifically wanted to point out the updated recommendations for infant feeding. And it now supports shared decision making and clarified a little bit on the breastfeeding guidance for people with HIV. And so to just briefly summarize, The risk of postnatal HIV transmission to an infant is zero if there is replacement feeding or formula used. The risk of transmission while breastfeeding is less than 1%, but not zero for those who have sustained undetectable viral load through pregnancy and postpartum. Um, And the new recommendation is supporting choices of people with HIV who choose to breastfeed if they are virally suppressed. Um, or if they want to formula or use replacement feeding. So previously, the U.S. guidance did not recommend breastfeeding for individuals in the U.S., but these guidelines do a a little bit, give you some leeway here to to work with your patients. And I think, like many people have mentioned, sort of shows the community input that has been a part of these changes and uh, increasing interest from both patients and their providers of of providing different options. And I think the other thing is, I'm not sure that, I don't think the old guidelines gave a specific sort of quantified risk for the transmission that you could quote to your patients. I suspect most of us were saying a number that's similar to that. Um, So there are other updates in the HIV guidelines. The other thing I wanted to emphasize is that the panel now recommends that infants at low risk of perinatal HIV transmission now can receive two weeks of zidovudine prophylaxis rather than four weeks. So that's exciting. Um, But yeah, and you know, I know I'm not covering everything, but I pulled out the two that I felt like were uh, new and exciting. Well, we'll have links for everyone to read more. And uh, yeah. just to to date myself, uh, Sarah, I don't know if you know, but I had already entered the medical profession um, when the first uh, AZT trials were being done right around um, yeah birth. So long, many many years ago. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, the um, the I'm going to hit a couple. So the article, the influence of rapid influenza diagnostic testing on clinical decision making for patients with acute Respiratory Infection in Urgent Care was published in CID. Um, The results are perhaps as expected. If you test for it, you will find it and you will treat it. Um, In this article, the investigators compared antiviral and antibiotic prescribing, imaging, and laboratory ordering in clinical encounters with and without rapid influenza diagnostic tests, RIDTs. Um, These this study compared patients with acute respiratory infection. Um, they had symptoms, and some received the rapid influenza diagnostic tests, and some did not at two urgent care centers. And they found that compared to patients without rapid influenza diagnostic testing, patients who were rapid influenza positive 
were more likely to be prescribed antivirals, uh, odd ratio of 10.23. I'm hoping that antiviral was something like Tamiflu and not something else, um, and less likely to be prescribed antibiotics, odds ratio of 0.15. So I think this makes a lot of sense, right? Someone comes in, you have the ability to test, you find out it's flu. Um, hopefully, um, not going to be doing a lot of antibiotics and hopefully going to be giving them appropriate therapy. Um, and actually, overall, comparing all the rapid influenza um, tested participants to the non-tested, uh, this testing was associated with increased likelihood of ending up um, using an antiviral and significant, about a 50% reduction in antibiotic prescribing odds. So um, yes, uh, tests can really improve the quality of care as we see here. Um, lots of interesting stuff going on with rabies. Those of you that follow me on Twitter, um, one that caught my attention was the story of a cow testing positive for rabies after exhibiting concerning symptoms such as choking and and breathing issues. Um, you know, reminded me of one of my favorite films, Old, Old Yeller, where uh, the uh, the the cow gets sick. Um, and I will make sure before I close out uh, this section, um, I'll be discussing a little bit more on um, the This Week in Virology clinical update, but Marburg in um, Equatorial Guinea and now um, potentially spreading to Cameroon. Poor cow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I will kick off our bacterial section. Uh, be sure to listen to This Week in Microbiology. Uh, this next one I have is a CDC health advisory outbreak of extensively drug-resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa associated with artificial tears. And this was from right in the beginning of February. So the CDC issued this advisory about infections of uh, VIM Verona Integron mediated metallobeta lactamases and GES Guiana. I actually am not totally sure. Uh, I know how to say that extended spectrum beta lactamase producing carbapenem resistant pseudomonas. So this has been in 12 states, mostly from artificial tears. And there have been reports initially from various brands from the patients who were diagnosed, but the majority noted a specific brand, uh, Esri Care. Maybe it's supposed to be easy, right? I was trying to see if there's a different yeah, way to say it. Some sort of it sounds like the right <laughs> Clever thing. Name. Uh, I did search them because I do wear contacts and the bottle is sort of like a dark blue. So if you want to check out your bottle, but basically the patients had a variety of presentations, including keratitis, endophthalmitis, respiratory infection, urinary tract infection, and sepsis. Um, so if you have these artificial tears, stop using them. And if your patients have concerning symptoms or, or new uh, keratitis and ophthalmitis. You can ask them about these tears, um, and then you can check out the link if you want to read more in detail about some of the cases that were reported so far. Yeah, we you know we had a case here locally, and I was very impressed. It was well oh, managed. It was cultured, confirmed, and uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you for the health advisory. Cool. The article: Epidemiology and clinical outcomes of non. HASEC gram negative infectoendocarditis was published in OFID. In this study, 123 patients were included. Um, this kind of gives us a survey. The most common pathogens were serratia, 43%, one of my favorites, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, 21%, and Kleb CLS species at 14%. 52% of the cases um, were among persons who injected drugs. Um, for whom serratia was the most common cause. I think that may have to do something with uh, this being in the water supplies. Overall, patients infected with um, Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas aeruginosa had higher microbiological failure rates than other patients, 23% versus 6%. Hmm. I was just talking about how I worry about serratia and endocarditis the other day. Um, okay, appropriately so. <laughs> and then had a discussion about how it's the pink mold in your shower, which I feel like always comes <laughs> up. Um, uh, so I hope you I mentioned have an Operation Sea Ar Spray, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that's the next portion of the talk that I'll okay. have to if they if they're still listening. <laughs> yeah, <Okay. laughs> 
they've already left the room. I'm just talking about it by myself. Um, so I pulled a paper from the New England Journal of Medicine, azithromycin to prevent sepsis or death in women planning a vaginal birth, or the A plus trial group azithro prevention and labor use study. Excellent trial name. Um, so this is a multi-center placebo controlled randomized trial. They assigned women in labor at 28 weeks gestation or more and who were planning a vaginal delivery to receive a single two gram oral dose of azithro or placebo. They took a look at two primary outcomes, a composite of maternal sepsis or death and a composite of stillbirth or neonatal death or sepsis. And during the interim analysis, the drug safety mo- drug and safety monitoring board uh, recommended stopping the trial for maternal benefit. Um, but just as a overview, there were a little under 30,000 women who underwent randomization and they found that the incidence of maternal sepsis or death was lower in the azithro group than placebo 1.6 versus 2.4% with a relative risk of 0.67. That P value is less than 0.001. Uh, And that number needed to treat to prevent one maternal death or sepsis event would be 125. Um, But this lower risk of maternal sepsis or death uh, was not paired with a difference in the newborn outcome. So there was little effect on the newborn sepsis or death. Um, Neonatal sepsis rates were 9.8 versus 9.6% in the two groups. Um, I actually picked this because I have to admit, I didn't really know very much about this topic or um, prior research. And I guess there was a recent, not recent, but prior U.S. trial and some other studies looking at azithromycin in women who had got, undergone cesarean delivery and received antibiotics. And in that trial, the use of azithro had a lower incidence of maternal infection, but similarly did not affect newborn outcomes. So uh, interesting. I realize that's like a knowledge gap that I I had not read about uh, this topic. So I don't know about you, Daniel, if you're more familiar than I was. You you know, it's interesting, right? I mean, I see this relative risk of 0.67, but then you're talking about this absolute risk reduction of, you know, 0.8, maybe less than 1%. And then are we going to start giving every single, you know, woman two grams of azithro? And then this is a multi-country placebo-controlled randomized trial. So um, yeah, it l- leaves me with a lot, a lot of questions about where where this fits in as far as like a guideline routine approach. Yeah, and there were um, I was trying to like dig into the. I feel like I need to spend more time looking at some of the details to see if there, you know, what other contributors there are to um, the maternal infection. But uh, yeah. seems like and I a wonder good... what, and I wonder what we're treating, right? Which which yeah. bacteria are we targeting? So yeah. Well, uh, hopefully we'll return to this topic. Yeah. Okay. Clinical significance of concomitant bacteria in patients with Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia was published as a brief report in the European Journal of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. Uh, They call it SABU, so Staph aureus bacteria, SABU. That's a new one for me. Um, So interesting enough, SABU was detected among 13.8% of patients with SABA, that's Staph aureus bacteremia, um, and performed urine culture rate compared to the literature about 10 to 38 33.8%. So in contrast to other studies, um, no association with the staph aureus in the urine and endocarditis was observed, but they did notice that the staph aureus uh, bacteria was associated with higher rates of the staph aureus bacteria recurrence after stopping those antibiotics. Um, They do mention some other studies that uh, suggest an association between staph aureus bacteria and higher rates of bone and joint infections. This, this, Sarah, I will confess, was a knowledge gap for me. I was just said, oh, yeah, it's in the urine. Of course, it's spilling. It's just so much in the blood that it goes spilling out. Um, But, yeah, maybe there's a little more science here that – I need to brush I was going to say the same thing that uh, when I see Steph Aris in the year, I think like, oh, well, their blood culture is going to be positive. And I, I don't know that I think of using it in a um, to help me sort of uh, think about how that patient's going to do in the future. I, I, I sort of have done the same thing. Like, oh, it's just a reflection of their bacteremia. 
Um, so I pulled a paper from MMWR, Health Disparities in Hemodialysis Associated Staph Aureus Bloodstream Infections, U.S. 2017 to 2020. So this is some surveillance data from the 2020 NHSN National Healthcare Safety Network and the 2017 to 2020 Emerging Infections Program. Um, so this surveillance data was used to describe bacteremias among patients on hemodialysis, and then they were linked to population-based data sources to try to examine the association with race, ethnicity, and social determinants of health. The unadjusted staph aureus bloodstream infection rates were highest among non-Hispanic, Black, or African American, and Hispanic or Latina hemodialysis patients. Um, and then when you, they tried to adjust for that EIP a site of residence and sex and vascular ask, access type, the staph aureus bacteremia risk was highest in Hispanic patients. Um, and then areas with higher poverty levels, crowding, lower educational levels accounted for a disproportionately higher amount of hemodialysis associated staph aureus bloodstream infections. Um, so I thought that was a interesting paper and hopefully we can, I try to pull ones that are, are sort of highlighting some of these health disparities if I see them. So I had to grab that one and include it today. All right. Well, I'm glad you grabbed that as people, um, sort of wonder any ID docs listen to this or non ID docs really, <laughs> um, because we're going to talk a lot about staph aureus today. <laughs> um, and I have to say this next one, this is going to be a hard paradigm to uh, break the article sequential oral antibiotic in uncomplicated staph aureus bacteremia, a propensity matched cohort analysis was published in CMI. So these are the results of a single center observational cohort at a tertiary hospital in Spain, including all patients with the first SAB, staph aureus bacteremia, I think it was Saba a moment ago, episode from January 2015 to December 2020. Patients were classified into the OST, that's the uh, patients received oral therapy after intravenous uh, group, that's the IVT, and then the IVT group who received exclusively intravenous treatment. They performed a propensity, propensity score matching to baseline um, differences, and the primary composite endpoint was 90-day mortality or microbiological failure. Um, secondary endpoints included 90-day um, staph aureus bacteremia relapse. So what did they find? So uh, about half the folks received OST, so you know oral after intravenous. About half the folks just stuck with the IV. Um, transition to oral when they did do it was um, in general done after seven days, but actually there was a range, interquartile range of four to 11. The primary endpoint occurred 10% of the time in the oral and 30.5% in the strict IV with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. Didn't see that coming. Um, staph aureus bacteremia relapses occurred in 3.6% versus 1.7%. Okay, so that, that went in the right direction. After propensity score matching, the primary endpoint was not more frequent in the folks that um, switched to oral. Actually, it seemed to me like it was less relative risk 0 0.42. So maybe about 58% less frequent, but we'll stick with the primary endpoint was not more frequent. 90 day relapses occurred similarly in both groups. Um, another way to word this is that oral was better with a 58% reduction in a composite endpoint of 90 day mortality or microbiological failure with a P value of less than 0 0.01. Um, but yes, randomized control trials will be needed. I don't know. Do you want to discuss this a little, Sarah? Because I have to say, in infectious disease circles, the idea of uncomplicated staphylococcal aureus bacteremia, <laughs> it's like a unicorn. There's always something we can find. Why? Yeah. I mean, this is complicated. <laughs> you can think. always find something. <laughs> it's like how when you look at a chest x-ray and someone who's like in the ICU, you can always like imagine a pneumonia. <laughs> it's, the same, something. it's the same way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And yeah, moving... I know. I was, when are we going to feel more comfortable um, actually calling something uncomplicated staph aureus bacteremia? I don't know. 
Well, I think when are we going to also start feeling more comfortable shortening a staph aureus bacteremia treatment yeah. from these just, um, you know, I had a gentleman, um, actually one of the, my colleagues was calling me today, um, who was, you know, he had he, this infectious disease doctor, the community had treated a patient for 11 weeks with IV um, therapy for an MSSA bacteremia. 11 seems a lot to me. Um, and just sort of interesting, um, you know, that they were then only now at 11 weeks discussing oh, no. potential transition to oral. So I do think maybe yeah. we've, um, We've done a bit with uh, with longer uh, over time. We probably need to rein that in a bit. All right, moving into fungal. And what I will say here with fungal is we needed this week in fungi, by the way. <laughs> but the article, mm-hmm. Genome-Wide Analysis of Heat Stress Stimulated Transposon Mobility in the Human Fungal Pathogen Cryptococcus D. neoformans was published in PNAS. So this group previously, I'm sure people have been following this literature, previously reported transposon mutagenesis as a significant driver of spontaneous mutations in the human fungal pathogen uh, cryptococcus during murine infection. Um, Mutations caused by these transposable elements, um, insertion into reported genes were dramatically elevated at high temperature. So 37 degrees, it's a little familiar, versus 30 degrees in vitro, suggesting that heat stress stimulates the uh, transposable element mobility in the Creptococcus genome. So this group, to explore the genome-wide impact of the TE mobilization, they generated transposable and accumulation lines by passage, in vitro passage, um, for multiple generations at the two different temperatures. And they observed that one of the retrotransposon was integrated primarily within genes um, with movement um, occurring exclusively at 37 degrees. So in short, it looks like elevated temperatures are favorable for those um, mobile elements, mm-hmm. and this may lead to microevolution and adaptation. So uh, to sum this up, so when it comes to fungi, being hot is not always that cool. <laughs> Excellent. Chef's kiss <laughs> for wrapping that one up. Um, well, uh, I feel like half, at least half of our podcast episodes may be mentioning the topic that our next articles are on. Uh, but I pulled from CID prevalence of ocular candidiasis and candida endophthalmitis in patients with candidemia a systematic review and meta-analysis. So this is a summary of the prevalence of ocular candidiasis and candida endophthalmitis, as suggested in the title, since the 1990s. This represented about 8,600 patients with candidemia who also underwent an opto exam. The authors found a pooled prevalence of ocular candidiasis being 10.7%. So any abnormal ocular findings in a patient who has candidemia. But of course here, the higher prevalence might be related to underlying comorbidities and not specifically the candida. Uh, Overall for candida and ophthalmitis, it was 3.1%. For concordant candida and ophthalmitis, 1.8% and discordant candida and ophthalmitis 7.4%. So the prevalence of concordant candida and ophthalmitis overall and among Asian countries was two times and four times higher than the prevalence reported by the American Academy of Ophthalmology of less than 0.9%. Um, they did talk a little bit about how there's likely some additional heterogeneity in the ocular candidiasis group and the discordant candida and ophthalmitis group. Uh, that could be related to the wide range of definitions. Um, but I feel like I sort of segue into your paper, Daniel. Yes, the counterpoint to this was, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like there's a there's a TikTok guy and he should do a TikTok about this, <laughs> but the uh, prevalence of ocular complications in candidemia, defining the bot- battlefield. Um, the authors in this piece suggest that an appropriate take-home point from the study just mentioned is that prevalence of concordant CE is not as low as previously thought, and even higher prevalence exists outside the United States. The questions if routine ophthalmological screening and longer treatment courses or other interventions result in better outcomes remain unanswered. 
while ocular candidiasis is one of the major and most feared complications in patients with candidemia, given the risk of developing severe sight threatening candidemia and ophthalmitis and ophthalmitis. Does discovery of ocular complications change management, such as the choice of agents, duration of treatment, and possible need for invasive procedures? Given the burden of ophthalmology consult the burden of ophthalmology consultations for ocular screening in patients with candidemia. Oh, you poor ophthalmologist. A recent position statement from the American Academy of Ophthalmology recommended only screening patients with signs and symptoms suggested of ocular infections, claiming CE as a rare complication since the introduction of fluconazole. I think in the small print, there's also, and please only request these between nine and five, Monday through Friday. In <laughs> contrast, the hardworking folks at the IDSA and the ECMM recommend that all patients with candidemia under, undergo routine dilated fundoscopic exam independent of time of day or day of week. I added that part. We sincerely hope that this difference in opinion between the two societies will not result in medical trench warfare with both sides doggedly dug into their opinion trenches with research studies lobbed like grenades from one specialty to the other, but to a new era of renewed clinical collaborative research that acknowledges the needs and expertise that exist in both communities. So I, I look forward to infectious disease doctors and their, their hardworking, you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five ophthalmology co colleagues getting together and really sorting this out. I do like that the take home message of both was, we should do some joint guidelines and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Just publishing um, warring papers. Uh, well, you know, I didn't mention glaucom plugin when I talked about pseudomonas eye drops, and we're talking about it. We'll just have to keep keep bringing it up, and one one day we'll catch his attention, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it is. You know, I have to say it's it's. You know, I don't know if entertaining is the right word, but you know, here you have these different societies, and they're just putting out you know these different guidelines. And I I do think it's sort of interesting that the the wording, the verbiage, given the burden of op ophthalmology consultations. Maybe we train a few more ophthalmologists to unburden them, or maybe we uh, hire a few more scribes, dare I mention Timothy. <laughs> 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 All right, parasitic. Be sure to listen to This Week in Parasitism. Uh, the article, The Rapid and Spontaneous Postpartum Clearance of Plasmodium falciparum is related to expulsion of the placenta was published in JID. Um, our listeners may not be familiar with the challenges of malaria during pregnancy, um, but during my recent time in Uganda, um, I saw um, a woman, uh, actually was, she was pregnant, she's an adult, um, otherwise protected, but she actually developed severe um, malaria requiring hospitalization. Uh, actually, I remember one in particular, but I saw several. Now, part of the challenge may involve placental sequestration of parasites. Um, parasitemia among pregnant women with protective immunity to P. falciparum malaria is often dominated by VAR2CSA positive infected erythrocytes. Um, this VAR2CSA is a member of the plasmodium falciparum erythrocyte membrane protein 1 um, family, which actually mediates um, sequestration in the placenta. So these investigators hypothesized that the previously observed spontaneous postpartum clearance of parasitemia in such women is related to the expulsion of the placenta, which removes the sequestration um, focus. Um, these investigators assessed parasitemias and gene transcription before and shortly after delivery in 17 Ghanaian women, um, and the precipitous decline in parasitemia was accompanied by selective reduction in transcription of the gene encoding VAR2CSA. Interesting. Yeah, that's really you look. Cool. You look interested, Sarah. Yeah, yeah. I actually, <laughs> I, I, I pulled that paper. I was really glad that you were going to talk about it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. Uh, well, we're on to our miscellaneous section. I pulled a paper from OFID, Adoption and Utilization of Social Media Among Adult and Pediatric Infectious Diseases Divisions and Fellowship Programs in the U.S. Um, 
I know some of the authors and we actually, they presented this at the same session that I talked about Febrile at ID Week. So I was excited to see that they had their publication out. Um, but for those who haven't read it, it's a summary of the US ID Fellowship and Division social media accounts that were out for both adult and pediatric programs. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, they found that about 70% of the accounts were adult and 30% were pediatric. Uh, most accounts were through Twitter, about a little under a third. Um, and most of the Twitter accounts were associated with larger programs and higher match rates. They also took a look at you know, what people posted about and the types of posts. And most of them, not surprisingly, were educational. Um, but just kind of a nice summary of how ID programs have and could use social media as a tool for recruitment and amplification of uh, those who are in their programs, um, their fellows, their faculty members. I mean, it certainly was impacted by COVID and virtual recruitment. And if you look at uh, the account creation figure one, there's just a line and it just goes straight up when COVID started. Um, you know, we'll see how things evolve since I feel like there's been a little bit of a split in people who were on ID Twitter and those who went to Mastodon or Post or, you know, wherever people ended up, which makes me a little sad because I feel like it fragmented a, a pretty awesome community. But I'm sure we'll circle back and <laughs> and reestablish that at some point. All right. Yeah, I actually, I, I opened my Twitter account December of 2019. So, all right. Yeah. The article, Canine Detection of Chronic Wasting Disease in Laboratory and Field Settings, was published in the journal Prion. Um, here is the problem. So chronic wasting disease is a fatal, transmissible, spongiform encephalopathy um, that affects both free-ranging and farmed cervid species, including mule deer, white-tailed deer, and elk. Um, due to the long incubation period and variability of clinical signs, um, CWD can expand and spread to new areas before um, they reach diagnostically detectable levels. So sure, one can wait until the cervids die and then do post-mortem testing. But in this study, they demonstrate that trained detection dogs which I do not hear today, can be used as an antemortem test for CWD. First, they trained three dogs to differentiate between CWD positive and chronic wasting disease negative white-tailed deer feces in a laboratory setting. They did not let the dogs eat it. They could just smell it. They then trained the same dogs to search for the CWD positive fecal samples in a more naturalistic field setting. I'm curious to see some photos of that. In the field, the dogs found 73% of the chronic wasting disease positive fecal samples and had an average false detection rate of only 13%. Interesting. I Googled mule deer while you were talking because <laughs> I didn't know if that was a different type of deer that I'm not familiar with. They're, they're but, cute, and it's the ears. The ears is what. Yeah, uh, they're very cute. <laughs> yeah. You know, I feel like if you have a study about a dog trying to sniff for an infection, it's like an automatic podcast mention. So Yeah, yeah. We'll Anytime you mention dogs and ID. And <laughs> dogs, deer, prions. I mean, hey, you know, you got yep. it all. Yep. <laughs> um, well, to wrap us up today, I have uh, an update from MMWR. You'll find the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, the newest recommended schedules for adults and children in the U.S. from 2023. I tried to pull out some of the updates, uh, and I will mention a couple. Hopefully, I, I don't think I'm going to be comprehensive in any way, but uh, for influenza, there is some information in there about the quadrivalent uh, flu vaccine for patients over 65. Uh, for the pneumococcal section, they did incorporate information about the higher valent vaccines, which we've mentioned on Puscast before. Um, so those who are over equal or over the age of 65, getting PCV20 or PCV15, and then PPSV23 a year later, um, but could give eight weeks later if they're you know high risk for disease. And so I think the most important take home here is that the CDC app for pneumococcal uh, vaccine administration. Uh, there's a hyperlink in the guidelines now, and I definitely use that resource because we all know it's 
can be confusing depending on the order that people receive their pneumococcal vaccines. Um, and then in the pediatric side, they did add in there that the PCV13 and PCV15 are interchangeable for healthy children. Uh, there's a COVID row, so two doses of Moderna, Pfizer, or Novavax. The j and is no longer recommended. There's the booster that's in there. Um, and then there's a, some notes in the poliovirus section for thinking about the use of inactivated poliovirus vaccine in adults who are at increased risk of in- exposure. Um, and then I think the other things that I pulled out, you know, there were some updates on within the sub like smaller text on MMWR and meningococcal and they rearrange the hep B section a little bit. But I think as long as people know that it's been updated, you can pull it up on your phone and definitely update your pneumococcal vaccine app if you haven't already. Um, but yeah, that brings us to the end of this podcast. As always, the references for the show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease Puscast at Apple Podcasts or microbe.tv forward slash Puscast. We love to get your questions, comments, and paper suggestions, so continue to send those to Puscast at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting the science shows of Micro TV at microbe.tv forward slash contribute or Parasites Without Borders at parasiteswithoutborders.com and click on the donate button. I'm Sarah Dong. You can find me on Twitter at swindong at Federal Podcast or at FederalPodcast.com. And I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, on Twitter at Daniel Griffin MD, as well as on the other podcasts, This Week in Parasitism and This Week in Virology Clinical Updates. And as always, thank you for this most interesting consultation and allowing us to participate in the care of this most difficult and challenging case. We shall continue to follow along with you. Thank you, and dictation, and goodbye. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious.